I'm delighted to say that my first guest has a CV that any jockey would envy. He has had to retire very recently on medical advice, prior to which he became one of the youngest jockeys ever to ride a winner at the Cheltenham Festival, when at just 17 years old he steered K. Rwani to victory in the Coral Cup. Subsequent to that, he ch switched his attentions to the flat and rode over 1,200 winners, including very productive spells abroad, most notably in Japan. He is a, uh, unique amongst his counterparts as not only having ridden winners at the Cheltenham Festival and Royal Ascot, but also having ridden grade one winners over jumps and on the flat, there was so much more to come, but sadly his career has been curtailed on medical advice. And now there are many things promised to him in the game. He is, of course, Fran Berry. Fran, welcome to Luck on Sunday. Morning, Nick. Yeah, great to be here. And great to have you here. I, uh, probably quite a difficult time for you in many respects, but to what extent have you, have you reconciled yourself to the idea that, that riding is done and the next chapter is, a, is about to open? Um, I think once the decision was made by the surgeon, that was it. You know, the, the previous month or six weeks, he, he put me on notice, Dr. Fai, um, I obviously got to fall in Wolverhampton, I was in the hospital for five days, got home, and uh, I've dealt with it before, so, you know, he, sent, he got my MRI scans, had a look over them, and uh, sent a report back to the team at Oxy House, my physio, Emma Edwards, and she said, you might might not like to hear this. Um, uh, I said, go on anyway, and uh, your injuries are X, Y, Z. And uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll see Fran in three weeks' time, but uh, it might be time to start thinking about a new career for him, you know. So from from that point on, I, I knew I might be in trouble medically, and uh, I just wanted to kick into rehab, and I was in Oxy House five days a week, two, three hours a day, but... Um, that was the worst time that month or six weeks between between that and the announcement because you're trying to battle against your body and uh, try to tell people that you're connected with that you're going to be back at, a, at the end of April and you know but you know you're not you're struggling a bit with it. So what what was the most serious injury what was the, essentially the injury that, that stopped you? Yeah I did two fractures in my neck I um, fractured C2 C3 vertebrae mm. you know they're quite high and uh, my movement upwards is is not good at all. So to get into first of all to get into a riding position, get down low and look between the horse's ears, I wouldn't have that movement. And uh, there's quite a bit of damage from the actual fall itself with ligaments and things. So I, d I don't think the strength would ever be there, you know, to take another impact and uh, you know a combination of being able to do your job with the movement and then you know the risk of you know further injury or more serious injury with a weakened neck. You know, so it's going to take a lot of rehab to get back to normal. You know. How are you feeling in yourself? Uh, very good now. It's done. You know, it's as I said, that month, six weeks was a pure turmoil. You know, you're panicking. You don't know what's going on. And, uh, you know, all you, all you want to do is the season the season gets going. All you want to do is get riding, get going again. But, you know, when Dr. Fy put me on notice, I um, had to go the other route and uh, look at, think outside the box. And uh, thankfully, when I asked a few people about if I wasn't going back riding, would, would the opportunities be there to move on and, you know, t have that... Uh, you know, when people said yes to a couple of things, it was a big comfort. So you were able to you were able to move on and move forward. Does it make it easier in a sense that although you're young, your career started very young. You, you were 15, 16 <laughs> when you were riding your first winner. You rode a Cheltenham winner at 17. Does that make it easier in a sense because you've accomplished so much? Yeah, I don't actually feel like I missed out a lot. You know, there's nothing that I can, uh, you know, uh, that I can say, God, I really need to do that again or, or get a go at that. You know, I would love to obviously ride at a Breeders' Cup or a Melbourne Cup, but with the exception of them two things, it, there's nothing. I a 23-year career went far better than I thought it could ever have went starting off. So um, in that regard, um, I'm very grateful for that. Everyone knows your, your father, Frank, who himself was a multiple champion jockey. Was it always written in the stars? Was it predestined that you were going to following his footsteps. Yeah, um, we just had ponies from day one and, uh, you know, I was going racing every time and uh, I was a real jockey uh, groupie, if you like. I'd be at the race, I'd be over the rail looking at what they're wearing, what gear they got, how to sit up and, uh, you know, my wall was plastered with pictures of uh, Generous and Alan Munro and that that's really where I got the bug around that time, you know, that style with the whip up in the air and uh, I was never able to replicate that style, but it was, uh, you know, it was just really got the bug. And then Dad was training, and uh, you're riding out and riding ponies on the gallops, and then graduate to the quieter horses. So, you know, at, at the time you could get a license in Ireland at 15 mm -hmm. years old. So from 13 years old, it was all about getting to that stage, you know, to get a license. You mentioned Generous and Alan Munro. He was a, a real groundbreaker in his time, wasn't he? No one had ever seen anyone who quite looked like that on a horse when, when he was riding in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, definitely not. You know, it's totally alien, if you like, to this Dunn style then and uh, the traditional style. And, uh, 
you know, I really latched on to that way of thinking and uh, I used to go around the gallop with the letters up and toe up and usually get run away by my pony, <laughs> but that was, uh, you know, just, it was totally new and very stylish and, uh, you know, something that, you know, really captured my imagination. And what did your, what did your dad think of that when you were doing your Monroe impersonation on the, <laughs> on the gallop? Did he say, come on now, drop your, drop your eyes a few holes? Yeah, yeah trying to be a bit more sensible in that, but, you know, you're young and you think you can uh, do anything on, on, on a horse and, uh, you know, he just encouraged me once I was enjoying it. I think that was the main thing. Making that transition from jumping to flat racing has become quite commonplace now. We've seen it with Graham Lee and PJ McDonald and Jim Crowley to, to great effect and, and many others. But you were a little bit of a, a groundbreaker in, in, in that regard at the time. When you were very young, could you have gone either way? Yeah, the biggest problem for me was weight-wise. You know, I just uh, was going, you know, from day one I was battling with my weight on the flat and day. Uh, there was no all weather racing and I was schooling jumpers all over herds. We had a five-month break in the winter time, so... I wanted to ride, so I just started riding over jumps, but then my weight was beginning to creep up, and, uh, you know, I was very much borderline, like I got up to 9.10, you know, I'd have to be sweating to do 9.7 over jumps in sometimes in the winter, so, um, you know, that that's kind of where the jumping end of it came out, but funnily, funnily the, that first winter over jumps got me going career-wise in the flat, so I did, you know, on the back of a good winter over hurdles, you know. And I, I mentioned your, your Cheltenham Festival winner, K Rowan. You reminded me, you'd actually ridden him the previous year as well, when you were 16? 16, I think, yes, yeah. I got beaten by top seeds that year and, uh, you know, beat a couple of lengths and it was massive, massive to go back to next year and just, just win, you know. I thought a uh, three-way photo finish and got by the line and uh, I didn't know if I'd won or not and I said, please don't be second again, you know. It's, uh, it was huge, huge to get that nod and get the photo finish result. And now we are fully accustomed to seeing 14, 15 Irish winners in a week at the Cheltenham Festival. It was only three days then, and if Ireland had two, three, four winners in the week, it was considered a, a pretty decent result. That must have made that an even more intense experience, particularly in these colours. Yeah, big time. You know, uh, obviously Chris Roach was a big, big influence on my career as well. He looked after me very well, both when he was riding and training, and uh, we're in contact now, even now. And um, you know, the McManus family been there throughout and very, very good to us. And, uh, you know, just to get a winner on St. Patrick's Day as well, you know, so everything was aligned for, a, you know, an Irish winner that day. It was fantastic. And uh, it was only it was only when I went back the next year to a couple of rides and they weren't much good and mm. you followed them around and it's only then you realise what an achievement it was actually to go and win, ride a winner there at that time. I was going to say you were so young at the time. Did you think, yeah, just this is the first <laughs> of many. I'll be, I'll be coming back and doing this every year. Yeah, um, I still get a bit of stick about it. But my first ever TV interview, I was asked, what, what are your ambitions going forward? And uh, um, I, I said I want to win, win the Gold Cup and the Grand National, so I didn't achieve them. But uh, <laughs> that's, uh, priorities change a bit then afterwards. Yeah. How clear in your memory is that day? Yeah, can't, uh, I can recall everything. It was actually, um, the previous year he travelled supremely well throughout the run. Uh, di di this year he did. He never travelled whatsoever. He was off the bridle all the way. Um, I got a new pair of goggles before I went out. They fogged up halfway down the back, so I had to pull them down. So I had very limited vision with kickback and everything. And uh, it was only at the, between the third and second last, uh, as, as the field began to turn, he got running through them that he got motoring. And once he passed a couple, he really got running. And... Um, T probably took me to the front sooner than what was ideal, you know, he idled when he got there, but when I turned to home, Ben Barry Garrity was on the inside, I think in purple colours, maybe maybe the party politics colours, and he says, go on, Franny, you know, something like that, and he got a flyer over the last, and, um, you know, the last 100 yards was all out, you know. And he was a, he'd be about the same vintage as you, wouldn't he? He'd have been a very young man at the time. Yeah, I started a year before Barry, because, you know, I was 15, he was 16 to get a jumps licence, but we've always remained in contact and uh, followed each other's career closely, I think, you know, so. And how much, how much through the rest of your career did you, did you still follow the jumping and sort of take a, take a real interest in it? Yeah, um, I have a lot of friends, a lot of people, you know, David Casey, Norma Williamson prior to that, and then obviously your dad with his involvement in the game, you know, and my brother Alan, you know, when he rode them a couple of Cheltenham winners, um, I think we were in a pub one day, you know, it was a quite week at home and, and uh, we were throwing papers up to the roof and that, so, uh, you know, jumping has always been a constant uh, part of my life, yeah. But you, most of your success has, has, has come on the flat. What, what attributes did you think you could bring to, to top-class flat racing that perhaps your background gave you? Did, did you feel you had an advantage? Um, I think uh, just them um, jump winners got me going on the flat quicker than I might have might, might, might have done if I stuck to the flat solely. I might have been a lot slower to get going and maybe wouldn't have got... You know, I, I was in a tough... Um, 
tough generation of apprentices. We had Eddie Hearn, Shane Kelly, Jamie Spencer. You know, there was four of us there all fighting with each other and having that jumps um, experience and uh, riding for a lot of jumps trainers who then had runners in the flat with them connections. It, it got me going. And I think rhythm-wise in that, it, it just uh, w- allowed me to wise up a lot sooner, particularly with staying-type races. So what was your what was your big break, do you think? Um Getting a few a few rides for John Ox, uh, flat wise, definitely getting a few rides for John. Um, he had a three or four fillies that that year. They were all running listed group trees all through the season, and I managed to sneak onto one or a filly called Dearly, and uh, I killed myself to do eight, eight five in her one day and got beat a short head in Mallow, and uh, he left me on her one or two more two more times through the year, and at the back end of the year won my first group race, the Blandford Stakes for for John on her, and uh, in the shape Muhammad colours, and uh, that was definitely a big break. I ended up getting the second jockey's job with John the next season. Mm. Uh, and John Ox has had such an amazing career and, and we remember his masterful handling of, of Sindar in, in the early part of the millennium and then, and then see the stars latterly. When you look at him now, do you think it's, it, it's a, a difficult situation that he hasn't got more horses? I know he's just joined forces with, with Paddy Prendergast, but do you, do you sort of look at that and think it's strange that, he, that he's lost that patronage? Yeah, I really do. Um, you know, from what I can gather, he's still training the same and the same routine. And, uh, you know, which um, he's just a fantastic trainer. And may, maybe fashion wise, everybody wants a quicker book now, if you like, you know, particularly with new owners that they want. And he's maybe more middle distance trainer that per se may be seen as that, that, you know, he's going to give his horses time and they won't um, come to themselves until their mid three year old career, you know, with his better horses at least. And uh, maybe suffer through that lack of. Uh, you know, people expecting, you know, they want the things to happen a lot sooner maybe than what they might think it ha- happened with John. But he's a fantastic trainer and just it's hard to believe that, uh, you know, in the back of Sea the Stars that things went uh, downhill from, you know, numbers-wise. Uh, what was he like to work for? What sort of man is he? Uh, completely, uh, uh, he's just the most easy-going man to work for in that, uh, you know, work mornings are serious and uh, to ride from the track, he gives you all the confidence in the world and... Um, you know, I used to bounce into work there Tuesday and a Friday and stalls on a Thursday. The great team around him and, uh, you know, there was a real team eat us to the thing where, you know, we'd, we'd Niall McCullough and Mick. Uh, Johnny was there first of all, Johnny Morton, then Mick Canan and, uh, you know, everybody was on the same page and trying to achieve, achieve the same thing and uh, just a really happy yard. And it struck me that at the time you were there and you were running a lot of big winners and it was a very powerful stable, but all those big powerful stables were trying to compete with the growing might of Bally Doyle, and essentially at the beginning of your career, Aidan O'Brien was just getting going, although he got going pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and then through the meat of it, he started to dominate and dominate and dominate. How hard was it, even for stables of, of your size, to meaningfully compete at the highest level when they were becoming so powerful? Uh, back then, it wasn't too bad. We kind of had, had a bit of an advantage, probably with the mile and a quarter, mile and a half fillies and things, but uh, that's totally, you know, with the Galileo breeding coming through now, it's. Uh, you know, last three or four years really took off, and uh, and it's just got harder for people to compete against that uh, firepower in Ireland. Um, but when I was there with John, we we, we could hold our own with a lot of them, and um, his second strings in them better race were as good as anybody else's first string, so it was a great position for me to be in at the time. And now we we sort of look at these these Group One races, and, and particularly in Ireland, and you see quite regularly Aidan having the first three home. And if that had been done thirty years ago, anybody, even the the great Dr. O'Brien had trained the first three home in a Group 1, it would have been headline news. Now we almost take it for granted. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? I, I sometimes sort of have to remind myself exactly what, what he's doing. Yeah, uh, it's only when you step away from it. Um, I obviously went to Leperstown last week, first day on racing TV, mm. and uh, I was down to ring after the ring after Bally Sachs, and uh, I was just looking at his horses and uh, the ammunition he has and the way he trains them and you know, gets the best out of them, which you know, you got to do... Um, it's frightening, you know, how good they are. Uh, did Did you have much experience for him and with him and, and working with him? Yeah, um, uh, Christy Roach it was stable jockey, um, and I used to go on two days a week down to Ballydale in Aidan's first or second year down there, so that was really good experience. You know, um, I'm sure it's changed a lot now, but back then, you know, you're riding 15, 20 bits of work in the morning, and uh, Saratoga Springs, Lavery, them type of horses were there, and uh, again, it was just a a big step up for me in the quality of horses, you know. Could you have had any inclination then when you were going in there a couple of days a week as, as to how enormous a juggernaut this thing would become? Uh, the potential was there, you know. It was obviously the crossover p- period between Vincent O'Brien and Aidan get, getting in and Coolmore was on a resurgence, but 
Um, you just got to look at the facilities and the money that was being pumped into it that uh, it was going to take time to, but uh, it was always going to happen really from looking back at it now because, uh, you know, the resources that they got in the breeding, it's, uh, you know, it's all coming to fruition in the last 10 years. Them first uh, seven, eight, ten years he's done there has really, you know, come to the fore now. Uh, the one thing, of course, Aidan has done in addition to training so many winners in, in Ireland and, and England is to go far afield, go abroad, learn about the game, internationalise the entire operation. And, and I, I've read an awful lot of, of what you've said about your experience riding, particularly in Japan and what it did for you as a, as a jockey. Would it be fair to say that that, that experience in Japan where you, you were very successful was one of the most important experiences of your life? Yeah, it really was. And it's funny how things come about at, at, at times when you, your back is to the wall, eh? Um, you know, I had my first year stable jockey to John and uh, I got offered a job in Japan and he wasn't keen that I go. He thought, you know, two, two or three months out there you might come back, um, you know, tired tired with the new season ahead. And uh, I kind of said no to it. And uh, then Johnny obviously left Bally Doyle and he got the retainer with the egg can. So I found myself out of a job, basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I rang back the people in Japan and said I'd love to go. And uh, I went there for two weeks, uh, second in Group 1. And... Uh, uh, just stayed on for two and a half months, and uh, you know, just out of a, a, a complete chance opportunity, and um, it developed into probably you know one of the most important parts part of my career in, in in the longer term and the latter years, yeah. And it's interesting because the, the jockeys who've done well in Japan, I mean, I'm thinking obviously of Ryan Moore and uh, Christophe Lemaire particularly, and latterly Ashin Murphy had a decent spell over there. It seems to have had a profound impact on them it's a very very different way of life different lifestyle how 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 easily did you adapt to that um, it took time um i'd love to be going starting up starting off now with the information that we had in my first winter out there i was riding group on races say uh, with japanese race cars and trying to figure out uh, so you know what what was what and my interpreter was trying to help me with with form and everything but uh, you know there's a lot more information we know a lot more about japanese racing now than we did then and uh no, but that's probably made, 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 it, uh, made it better and uh, maybe work harder to, get, to achieve things out there. And, uh, you know, this is my biggest winner out here. Um, Dan and Ballard in the American Jock, Jock Club Stakes was Group 2, and, uh, and that was a huge day for us out there. And I would imagine prize money for a Group 2 in Japan is uh, significantly in advance of all our Group 1s. <laughs> yeah, I think it was £400,000 at the time, uh, starting maybe to the winner. Yeah, it was a big, big day. Not, not without controversy of... Um, I um, tightened up a lot on the rail and it ended up getting a six-day suspension over, over there, which wasn't ideal, but um, we all make mistakes at times. We, did you feel liked there? Were you popular in Japan amongst the horsemen? Yeah, um, I, I got on well with people. I just seemed to click with people over there, and uh, I, I think they liked... Um, you know, it was kind of outgoing and, uh, you know, tried to make an effort to understand their culture and um, try to learn a little bit of Japanese, you know. So I think if they see you making an effort and trying to engage with them, you know, it does come across quite well and they appreciate it. And um, uh, I think i got a reputation over there that I'd do my best in any any horse, whether it was a favourite or a 100 to 1 chance. And, you know, that, that counted. In, in, in some years gone by, I might have had the best season in Ireland, but I all seemed to get a licence to go back there, which, uh, you know, obviously your previous form there counted for a lot, you know. How's your Japanese now? Uh, I lose it every time I came back uh, after winter. I had in great intentions of learning it, but uh, then obviously the day job over here gets in the way. But I, I, I was in I actually had dinner with uh, Japanese friends recently, and they were talking, and uh, I could get the gist of the lingo. If I can't speak it, I can understand what they're saying in a way. That'll do for me. How's your karaoke? Not good. <laughs> Not good at all. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> and you say you you were quite outgoing. Is that is that you as a personality? Have you always been somebody more? Extrovert than introvert? Uh, not really, no, not really. Yeah, it took it took a long time. I was very uh, shy, and uh, I'd have to force force myself to do a lot of uh, things and put myself out of my own comfort zone. And uh, I think over there, I just felt that if you don't, you know, make an effort, you're you're just going to be somebody passing through for a couple of months and not seen again. And uh, I just thought um, anyone could ride horses over there, but if you can make an effort to engage the press, engage the fans, and uh, you know, on a, on a cold day in Akiyama, um, when all you want to do is get back to the shower, I could be signing autographs for half an hour, 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, I think the JRA and the local public appreciated that, you know. It just goes to show it, it is much more part of popular culture there than perhaps even it is in Ireland, let alone England. Yeah, um, the only way I can describe Nick is it's like a premiership football in England. It's got that profile, you know, all the... All the riders, trainers over there, they all seem to be on the, if they get married, they're on the equivalent of their Hello magazine. And, you know, they got that, 
you know, everyday people know a lot about racing over there. And did you warm to that or did you find it a bit weird? Um, I, I was lucky I could uh, get to train, train to the track on a Friday and uh, just put on a woolly hat and nobody really re- recognised you. You'd spend an hour and a half on the train, maybe change tw- twice in Tokyo, whereas the local jockeys uh, wouldn't be able to get on a train on Friday, go, they'd be mobbed, you know. So um, I was a bit an- anonymous in the way that I could dip in and out of it. So, um, you know, at the races, you're well known, but in, living in Tokyo Monday to Friday, you could do your own thing. When you, when you look at your career in the round, it's one thing to be able to ride horses and have the talent, have the innate talent, which you clearly had under both codes. To what extent is part of being a successful jockey the ability to sell yourself as a human being? Uh, it's major. I think, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of riders uh, through my career that uh, could ride a lot better than me, but uh, might not conduct themselves in the right way. And um, I think um, when Dad was training for 10 or 11 years, I got to live with what a trainer had to put up with and all the highs and lows of that and dealing with owners. And uh, that gave me a really appreciation for um, what um, a, a trainer has to do to get a horse to the track and deal with owners and I always like to think that my feedback was quite good but equally I was able to you know sp- give the t- owners their time after race you know to help the trainer and you know make their day day out um, you know something that they'd have a good memory of rather than rather than not and I- if you do that you can often get away with a bad ride too. Obviously your, your dad Frank has had a, a long and, and very successful career as racing manager to JP McManus but prior to that, as you say, he trained for, for 10 or 11 years. Did, did his experience as a trainer, has it deterred you from taking out a, a trainer's licence? <laughs> Very much so. I'd have no intention of doing it. Um, if, if the economics were better and in a perfect world, you'd love to do it. But uh, when you see the harsh reality of, reality of it, I uh, definitely wouldn't uh, be going down that road. Has anyone tried to persuade you to do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, even the people that uh, do it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough game and... Uh, you know, just uh, with with the finances, and uh, you know, they're not even guaranteed to get paid at the end of a month for training a horse. You know, it's uh, you know that's the toughest part. And uh, I think staff is becoming a very you know, you know, going to be a big issue going down the line for people to recruit staff and uh, get 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 them out, get their horses out. You're admirably philosophical about the fact that your career has ended not on your terms, essentially. That you've been told that that's that's the the end of the road. I, I suppose for for me, and I think other people in in this country. The, the sadness, in a way, is that there was so much more that could have happened here because you were starting to just build these interesting little alliances with lots of stables in, in England. How much have you enjoyed the last sort of three or four years based, based in the UK? I, I've really enjoyed it. I know it wasn't uh, straightforward between, you know, I was injured three or four times. Um, you know, with Rafe, we had a great first year, then the second year didn't work out and we parted ways. Um, but it's been a huge experience, you know, and uh, I did... I did Actually, in Dublin last week, got a taxi driver. He said, "Oh, you must regret going to England." And uh, actually, got me thinking. I, I have no regrets on it. It's been probably the best three years of my life, if not career. You know, and uh, it's just just a shame it had to end, but it did. Um, you know, the groundwork last season, I think, was we were set up for a good year this year. So you say that it was the best three years of your life, if not your career. What about your life has been so fulfilling in that in that period? Um, it just takes out your comfort zone. You know, I had, I had twenty years at home of um, of not being in a comfort zone, but comfortable. I knew people, and I, I could pick up the phone to people. Over here, you know, I had to come over cold. Even though I've ridden for people, I knew certain trainers here. I really had to put myself out there, and, uh, you know, I, I'd always be apprehensive about picking up the phone cold to people, but I had to do that, and it uh, just took, took us out of our shell. And uh, my wife, Laura, it was a lot harder for her to move over with, with, a, kid, with a young baby. Uh, Jordan was 18 months at a time, and probably harder for her than it was for me, but, you know, I think it just... Um, you know, it was a good life experience for us, and uh, we've, we've really enjoyed it. Uh, and as far as the people you, you enjoyed riding for, people perhaps who you hadn't met before and, and started to build relationships with, who, who did you get most satisfaction out of riding winners for? Um, Henry Candy and David Benuzzi, uh, they were the two that were really good to me. Ian Williams was exceptional as well. Um, but, you know, I split up with Rafe on a Saturday, and um, I hadn't re- I had one ride, I think, for Henry before, but he rang me on Sunday morning and said... Um, you might be at a bit of a loose end. Would you be interested in coming in a couple of mornings a week and uh, in his dry wit of his? And uh, you know, the, I, I, for the day I went in there, I felt a part of the team and a, and, uh, a really happy yard with a good atmosphere. And you know, it was if it's going to be your last winner, I was glad it was. I wrote it for him in, in a way. You know, it's like when 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 Rafe comes on luck on Sunday, and he's a fairly frequent visitor to the show, and he's good pals with Stuart Williams. He's coming on later. I do always tease him about. <laughs> How many how many jockey relationships he 
has has been through. But it, it is difficult when you're a trainer and and you're employing a stable jockey. It doesn't. It, it's just one of those relationships that's very particular, isn't it? It's it's not straightforward. Not not straightforward. And you know, and things are going well. Even at times, it's not it's not straightforward. And uh, the first year we had a great time. You know, we had a Royal Ascot winner and a couple of group winners. And uh, unfortunately, the second season we started off good. Air yeah, pilot won his group race in Ace, but. After that, the horses uh, never hit the ground at all. They were running poorly, and uh, it was probably frustrating for Rafe and for me. You know, I was ringing him up on the way home and saying this this horse didn't run up to form or didn't feel, you know, and whatever. And I suppose he got tired of say- hearing the same thing. And uh, um, I think the day of a traditional stable jockey is, is, is going, you know. I think, uh, you know, with people with 150 and 200 horses, not, not every jockey is going to suit every horse, you know. And I think... Uh, you know, with owners the way it is now, I think you know you need a pool of maybe three or four jockeys to use on certain type of individuals, and uh, you know it's. Uh, but it was good times uh, until until the finish. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned David Manuizier, who's just quietly, quietly, quietly worked his way to being quite a respected trainer of, of a nice pool of horses, and that partnership with Thundering Blue became. Became a very popular one last mm. year, didn't it? The, the horse sort of captured the imagination a little bit. He did. He was a bit of an under, underdog, was he? And I suppose being a grey, you know, he, you know, he, he always uh, captures the public's imagination as a way in his style of racing. You know, the way he, he come from behind, and uh, he um, he just came along at the right time for me. You know, David was adamant uh, early in the year that this was a group horse in, in waiting, and he got beaten to John Smiths, and to go back to York this day and win this Group Two and get up close home was major compensa- compensation, and. Uh, you know, it's uh, he he was a you know for your last year riding to have a horse like him and mm. you know get to Canada and uh, back to Japan it was really fantastic. And it's one of those horses that you just sit and sit and sit and hold on to. Kind of exci- nice, to, exciting to watch, really. Yeah, he was the type of horse I really enjoy riding. You know, you got to wait a race up. You're at, you're at the mercy of of a race with pace. You know, I need a bit of a good gallop on from. But um, he was just um, he made made your job easy. Once he got passing one horse, he'd come on the bridle and. Uh, He'd, he'd finish finish out his race ex, extremely qu- strongly, and um, you know I hope he does really well for him this year. He could uh, hopefully win a Group One from somewhere somewhere along the line. And you think the trainer's got what it takes to to break through to the next level? Yes, most definitely, most definitely. Um, he's um, very patient, uh, prepared to give his horse all the time in the world, which you know commercially might not. Again, he's in the mold of a John Ox rather than some of these sharper. Uh, two-year-old type trainers, and uh, but if you had a middle-distance horse that needs time, I'd recommend him highly. I think he's, uh, you know, going to hear a lot more from from him given the ammunition. It strikes me that all the people that you formed good alliances with through your career are all quite similar. They're all quite quiet, quite patient, not that demonstrative. Horse comes first. They're not pushing, 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 striving for the next winner, the next hundred winners. Is that, is, are those the sort of people you think suited your personality and suited the way you rode horses? Yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, probably to my detriment on days, um, I, I, if, if a race didn't work out, I might have been, uh, if things didn't go to plan through a race, I, I might not be inclined to, you know, beat a horse up to get fifth position. And, uh, you know, I'd also be thinking the next day and I think, uh, you know, the people who rode for through the years appreciated that, you know, but whereas other people might not have, you know, and, uh, you know, if you build up down longer-term relationships with people, they, if things don't work out on a day, you can come back and tell them why it went wrong, and at least have a horse to go.